Hi everyone, welcome to the July edition of Cybar. So as many of you will know, the pubs opened earlier this month and as much as we would love to be with you in person, sharing a beer and enjoying the science tonight together, unfortunately it's still not really safe for us to do so. So once again, we are coming to you virtually. But on the bright side, it means you get to enjoy all this science from the comfort of your own home. Um, and hopefully you're doing so with the beverage of your choice as well. So we're really excited about tonight's event, um, not just because the topic is so interesting, but it's got a lot of attention um, from you guys as well, which is great. Um, and I will point out that one of the advantages of us coming to you virtually is that tonight's event is being recorded. So if you know anyone that wanted to um, take part tonight but couldn't um, come along, then they are able to catch up on our Palace of Science YouTube channel. They can watch tonight's events and all of the other events that we have recorded in lockdown as well. So um, for any of you that are not familiar with Palace of Science, hi, thanks for coming. Um, we are a not-for-profit organisation based in the northeast of England um, and we host uh, lots of different events throughout the year to showcase all the science and research that's happening in the northeast and importantly to bring that to a public audience for you guys to enjoy. So Cybar is our regular event. Um, we hold it every month. Every month we get a different speaker talking about a different topic, usually from a totally different field. Um, so if you enjoy tonight's event, there will undoubtedly be something similar in the future. And if you don't, then there will be a lot of everything else as well. Um, to get an idea, you can obviously check out any of our social media pages. So um, the talk tonight is going to last about half an hour and then we're going to take a quick five minute break and then we'll be coming back for a question and answer session. So obviously when we normally do this in sort of a bar setting it becomes more of a discussion with you guys, the audience. Uh, it's your chance to really ask all of your uh, questions about the topic to the speaker. You can still do that tonight. There is a chat box on the right hand side. Um, so if you do have any questions for the speaker tonight please do type your questions in there and we will come to them at the end with the question and answer session. And even if you don't have a question, um, just type in there anyway. Say, say hi, tell us where you're watching from, uh, what brought you along this evening, what you're wearing. You know, we're interested in all these important details. Um, so I'll stop blabbing on now. I think I've said everything I need to say. And I'll turn over to tonight's speaker, um, Dr. Becky Owens. So she is a lecturer in psychology at the University of Sunderland. She's involved um, in a number of really interesting projects, actually. Um, you can look them up on her uh, University of Sunderland page. Um, but tonight she's going to talk about her work on body modification in the form of tattoos. Um, so that's everything from me. Please give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Becky. Hello, thank you, Nicola. Um, so, my name is Becky. As Nicola says, I'm a lecturer in psychology. ink into the dermis of your skin so it's not the top layer it's it's underneath that and um, typically in the UK um, we use needles electric needles various sizes and um, you can get single ones you can get with lots on or you might see some people do it manually as well so you might see you know just a needle tipped with chopstick or something and, and poked in like that you might, if you've ever had any childhood accidents involving pencils, have a little pencil tattoo from falling over and forcing that into your skin, for example. So however you are forcing pigment into the skin, it's something that hurts. Um, there's a lot of different factors that affect how much it hurts. So you might think about whereabouts on your body you're getting it done. You might think about who is actually tattooing you. Some people are very gentle, some people are less gentle. 
And you might think about this style of work that you're getting done as well. So whether it's something that's very delicate or whether it's something that's really requires a heavy hand, um, it all affects how much it hurts. Where tattooing came from is often credited with um, Captain Cook. So it's said that Captain Cook, on his travels, he brought back tattooed people um, to kind of showcase them to, to um, us Westerners, essentially. And so these, these guys looked very unusual in comparison to what people had been used to seeing. Um, and it was said that Westerners were really gawping at, at their tattoos and they were called, you know, they called them tattooed savages. Um, it was something that, you know, people were quite wary of. It was something that was very different. They looked at their bodies as being something that was very uncivilized in comparison to the Westerners' bodies. Um, and, it, and it immediately, you know, put this us versus them kind of front about that. So this origin narrative is a little debated. So even if you don't necessarily agree with that as the introduction of tattooing into the UK, we even just go as far back as, you know, the beginning of the last century. Tattooed people were still kind of displayed and paraded in, in you know, circuses. They were displayed as freak shows. People wanted to come and look at them from afar, you know, from a safe distance. This is something that's very strange. It's something unusual. I would like to have a look at this unusual thing, but I don't want to get too close. I think possibly a lot of this stigma and this being wary of tattooed people kind of probably originates from the fact that tattooing does hurt a lot. So if you think um, from the perspective of someone who's never had a tattoo before, um, the idea of going and getting tattooed seems really counterintuitive because you are voluntarily putting yourself in that position where you are in a lot of pain you are creating an open wound on your body. And that means that it increases your risk of infection. Um, you know, pathogens and things like that can potentially infect that wound, just like any other wound. You've got to care for it and, and, and make sure that you're all right. But in the meantime, while your body's healing from this wound, you're also vulnerable to other viruses and infections. It's really common to see people get um, like colds and cold sores and things like that after a period of tattooing. So it might be that this this idea of, well, why would people, anyone in their sane mind, go and voluntarily put themselves in this position? Maybe that's kind of been the gateway for a lot of the stigma that comes with tattooing. Even in the older literature around psychology and tattooing, so I say older literature, this is probably from like the 60s and things like that. The assumptions about people with tattoos is very implicit it doesn't seem to be questioned at all and um, it's just there's something psychologically wrong with tattooed people whether this is something to do with their IQ they clearly must be very stupid to be to be doing this or whether this is something that's pathological that there's something wrong with them they're mentally unwell to be to be doing this they, those assumptions seem to be just innate in the literature nobody questioned those assumptions it's all about looking at things like criminality and delinquency in tattooed people and and comparing that to non-tattooed people more recent literature um questions those assumptions a little bit but still even in in the last century perceptions of tattooed people have been not so good so Tattooed people are seen as less competent, typically seen as more aggressive, mentally ill and considered to be delinquents. Men seem to fare a little bit better in these perceptions than women do. So women are seen as less intelligent, but also as more promiscuous and as heavier drinkers. Whereas men typically seen as more dominant and healthier and more masculine. That, that specific piece of research there was done in 2015. I'll mention that again shortly. But the very recent research that's coming about suggests that actually these attitudes are changing and there's maybe less stigma attached to having tattoos and even visible tattoos now. So people are not as biased against hiring tattooed people. Um, people don't necessarily look at a tattooed person and think that they're incompetent or that they're stupid. Um, and again, there's probably a lot of factors involved in this. Um, part of that will be the fact that, you know, us as a tattoo generation coming through are going to be in positions of hiring and firing other people. 
So we don't have those necessarily innate biases and stigmas against tattooed people as a blanket stigma, you know. Um, and some of it as well will be about increasing um, opportunities and things. So tattooing has taken off a lot in the last sort of 20 years-ish. And it, you're pretty hard pushed to find someone who's not tattooed now. So the idea of maybe reserving employment opportunities for people who aren't tattooed, you might be hard pushed to actually find anyone to be employed if that's the case. So all those things considered, it's probably quite um, an easy question to answer about why we might not get tattooed. Um, so, you know, considering the stigma, you know, it's sometimes like fighting an uphill battle um, in terms of battling stigma and bias around being tattooed. And then you've got the aspect of permanency. So if you ask non-tattooed people some of the reasons why they don't want to get tattooed, one of the things they'll say is the permanency. Um, tattoos are considered to be permanent. Once you've put that ink in your skin, it is hard to get out. You can get it out. So this is a picture of um, some laser that I had done a few years ago. All those little dots that you can see there are these like burnt blood blisters where the lasers try to like blast the ink particles apart and it's caused burning. So it can be done. It's painful and some some types of laser are more painful than getting the tattoo in the first place. It's expensive. It's a long process. Um, I've no doubt that removal techniques will get better as the future goes on, but this is where we're at with this at the minute. Um, another aspect, the pain associated with it. So we've talked about this as well. So the idea of pushing pigment into your skin, it's going to be a painful process no matter how much you try and get away from it. And all the other risks that come along with it. So we think, what if it goes wrong? What if something goes wrong? What if you've gone to an artist who maybe isn't very reputable? What if you get some kind of an infection? Or what if you go to a really reputable artist and they just make a mistake? They're human, just like all of us. You know, we, we can make mistakes, but the permanency of that mistake is going to have big, big consequences for whoever that is on. What if it doesn't heal right? What if you ignore advice from your artist and you go swimming the next day and all the white highlights have gone a lovely shade of green and it's all gone a bit wonky and it's gone scabby and disgusting and it's yellow now? What if you then come to regret it, even if it's healed lovely? What if you regret it? So in the UK, the legal age to get a tattoo is 18, but we know that the conscious, rational decision-making part of our brains don't fully develop until we're about 25-ish. So what if we have been too impulsive at 18? What if whatever it was we wanted to show at 18 about who we are and who we represent and who we can affiliate with and everything, what if that's just changed dramatically by the time we're 25 and then onwards? It can also be really expensive and time-consuming. Not always, but a lot of people will, you know, travel the country or even travel the world to go and see the best artists. So you think about the time and the expense added into that. Um, day sittings, you're looking at up to thousands of pounds a day to go and sit with a really high profile artist. You add into that your travel and expenses, time off work, childcare, if you've got those kind of considerations. It can be a really, you know, a lot to think about and a lot to bear in mind. So not getting tattooed, probably one of the easier questions to answer. Why do people get, get tattooed then? So I want to look at an example here of the Chambri tribe of Papua New Guinea. And they, they undergo something called a crocodile scarification ceremony. And this is a sacred ceremony. Um, and it's, it's purpose, primary purpose is to separate the men from the women. So at the ages of around 11 up to 30, the men are taken away or the boys are taken away from their families. They're put into this, this other house for a period of around about six weeks and they undergo this scarification ceremony. Um, so scarification ceremony, they use little blades to make cuts around about two centimetres all over their torso and the top of their bums and then they rub into those cuts things like tree, uh, tree bark and oil and clay to really make those scars stand out once they've healed. So have a look at these pictures of that. So you can see there that 
the the scars are really raised the purpose of that is to better represent the crocodile skin um and if you see this picture here um it's not exactly um a, a sanitary environment that this is happening um so think about all the extra risks that are associated with this there's no sanitation we're not in a, a, a clean studio or anything like that um so all the extra risks that come along with that and the impact of that on the healing and everything and then add into that that part of this ceremony is the psychological aspect of the guys who are getting it done must remain composed throughout they're not allowed to flinch or flicker no crying not showing any pain they've got to remain stone faced to show their psychological strength so this is part of showing their ascent into manhood as well so as well as separating the men from the women it's a marker of manhood and showing how well you well showing your suitability of of growing up essentially you've become a man by being able to withstand this now before i go any further i kind of just want to give you a little bit of context about this so for context I'm an evolutionary psychologist. There's lots of different areas in psychology and there's different approaches you can take to understanding any behavior. And what it means to be an evolutionary psychologist is kind of thinking about the environment that humans evolved in and what that means for us today. So obviously we've evolved in a very different environment. So it might be difficult to think about the relevance of that at all. But what it is, it, it, it says a lot about it's, it's more thinking about our motivations and our instincts. So it's less thinking about how we consciously think about things, how we make decisions, consciously thought out decisions. It's more thinking about our motivations and how we might be motivated towards something or away from something. Or we might have these innate impulses that we sometimes don't even know why they're there ourselves. And I operate in this framework. So this framework that you, you can see on, on the screen now is suggested from um, a famous ethologist, Nico Tinbergen. And he said that in order to understand any aspect of behavior well enough, you need to think about four different explanations. And if you consider all of those different explanations, put them all together, you probably got a good explanation of that behavior. So the first one is the mechanism. And what that is, is looking at what is it in the environment that initially directly triggers that behavior? The next one is the development. So that's considering how, um, like your experience through your own, um, what experiences have you had with this behavior as a child? How were you socialized in that way or anything like that? The phylogeny considers the developmental history but further than your lifetime so we can go beyond our own lifetime we can think about past environments we can think about even non-human animals and aspects of behavior in non-human animals and what that might tell us about behaviors that we see today in humans we can even look at examples from cross-cultural um, examples so like we've just looked at the Chambri tribe there what that allows us to do is kind of theorize about how tribes might have existed and operated at the time that we evolved and begin to apply it to us as well. And finally, the function, this is this is where I focus on, it's looking at whether a behavior is adaptive. So has it helped our survival or has it helped us to be able to reproduce? Or has it not been adaptive at all? Maybe it's a byproduct of something else that was adaptive. So we consider the function. So this this aspect, um, this perspective really kind of speaks to me more more than the other um, aspects because I see myself as a bit of a, of a, of a naggy toddler and I don't want to just know how the mechanism works. I want to know why it works like that. And I want to know why the developmental aspects work like that. So... I feel like this is the only perspective where I can kind of satisfy my but why, but why, but why kind of perspective. So if we think about this in, in terms of body modifications and tattooing, we might think of approximate mechanistic um, explanation as um, famous person has this tattoo. Look how really good that tattoo looks. So, for example, when Cheryl Cole first got a little hand tattoo here, 
And all of a sudden, at that point in time, everyone thought, well, hand, hand tattoos are acceptable now. Whereas before that, no one was allowed them. You weren't allowed to get them. They were job stoppers. And if you got a visible tattoo like that, you were done for. So phys- a famous ta- person gets a tattoo. That looks good. I'm going to go and get one of those tattoos. That looks really good. What about your own development? Did your parents have really strict attitudes about tattooing for example was it just something that was reserved only for criminals were you forbidden from looking at tattoos or thinking about tattoos because you would never get a job if you if you got any um or were they actually really supportive did they encourage you to have a look at that is it something that your parents have themselves and they can tell you all about it from their perspective so again we've just looked at some cross-cultural evidence about this operating in, in tribal um kind of scenarios And then thinking about how this may affect survival and reproduction. So from that evidence where we've just looked at in the Chambri tribe, you think about the sanitation and the the circumstances, the environment that those modifications are going on, that might actually hinder survival. So how can that be good for reproduction and for passing your genes on into the next generation, which is what an evolutionary focus is? So even if it might hinder survival, it might cause survival problems and health problems, it might actually aid reproduction because it might show other people how genetically fit you are if you heal really well and um, if you manage and tend your wounds really well, it shows an aspect of how how caring you are and how good at tending to wounds you are and as well as your innate healing abilities. And if we think about the environment that we evolved in, having this kind of genetic fitness was something that was it would have been like a natural immunity really in a in a time where we didn't have vaccines and medical care and great sanitation so this was something that was really important in terms of our future survival so thinking about our ancestors and how we evolved um Obviously, this is kind of updating all the time and as new evidence comes out. But one thing that we're pretty sure about is that we evolved primarily in really small scale hunter gatherer tribes. So this setup, especially a a global, potentially global setup like this, um, living in towns, living in cities, is something that is really quite alien to us. And it's something that's very new in an evolutionary perspective. We used to being able to live within a small tribe where we know each other, we can identify each other very quickly. And one thing that would have been a really big threat to our survival would have been other humans. So people from other tribes. So it was really important to be able to identify quickly and efficiently who was a member of our in-group and who was a member of our out-group. So even though that threat's not there anymore, it doesn't mean that that motivation's gone away. So we have this instinct to be able to show who we do identify with, who we affiliate ourselves with, and who we don't. Um, So we can see some examples. I've I've mentioned Cheryl Cole there. Um, A lot of people going out and getting similar tattoos, be able to show that this is something that you might like because you've seen it on her, that she's kind of endorsed it. Some other examples. So this one is um, shows that someone who who's had a double mastectomy following breast cancer. So this this tattoo shows I'm a I'm a breast cancer survivor, or it might be something that is a way of reclaiming ownership of of a part of of this person's body that's been physically and emotionally and psychologically really painful to deal with. Um, so it could function as both of those purposes. Some more examples here. So we've got this tattoo here that's commemorating a dad, um, whether the dad is passed or not. So if their dad has passed, it might be a way of continuing bonds. Some people use tattoos as a way of continuing bonds with people who have passed. Or it might indicate important values to somebody um, in terms of their family meaning an awful lot to them. This other little tattoo down here, the semicolon tattoo, is something that indicates health and well-being, mental health and well-being primarily. So if you know what that tattoo means and if you see that on somebody else, then you've instantly got a connection with them. 
if you don't know, then you don't know and it doesn't trigger anything in here. But it might be something that kind of serves as a conversation starter or a conversation stopper. And here's a couple of other things here. So here's some tattoos from a horror fan um, indicating fan fandom of, of the horror genre. And here's another one. That one's a fake tattoo, but it's um, it was important in the show anyway. Um so it shows something. If you see if you see these kinds of tattoos on somebody, it might be something where you think there's somebody who I can relate to. It's something that's loosely based around your social identity and identifying other people within your in-group versus your out-group. So you might see someone and think, I really want to talk to that person. I love them tattoos. That's something that I really like as well. Or you might see them as well and kind of roll your eyes and walk away and think, I don't want to talk to that person. I have nothing in common with that person. So it shows a lot of social information. <clears throat> so I mentioned before about reproduction as well, and the idea that reproduction is also really important when considering evolutionary perspectives on behaviour. Um, so we mentioned in the Chambri tribe, you know, the ascent into manhood um, and how physically, genetically fit the men are in, in kind of managing this, this um, ceremony and as well how psychologically strong they are having to deal with that so we see evidence of this in other tribes as well so for example this lady here and um, she is a part of one of the tribes in ethiopia and when they become of age the women become of age they get these scarifications put on their heads they get these marks of scarification like this um and part of that is to show coming of age so it represents that they're going Going to be reproductive um, re reproductively fit from now on Repro and, and fertile they're ready they're ready to kind of reproduce but they also um, the, the, they also have to remain really um, stoic and composed through the through the ceremony as well because it shows how well they're going to manage during childbirth something again that's very painful so it shows to the other people in the tribe how well they're going to be able to manage that um, and these ladies here as well, so they've got facial tattoos. All these three ladies are from different tribes, but you can see similarities in the tattoos in the sense that they show symmetry. Um, so one aspect of symmetry, and with this lady's scarification as well, symmetry is really important because it's an indicator of um, physical attractiveness. And it shows, if, if you're very symmetrical, it shows your genetic fitness in being symmetrical, being able to fight off diseases and pathogens, especially through your developmental environment. So these tattoos and scarification and body modifications really highlight their symmetry. But the thing that differentiates these three ladies with the facial tattoos is essentially they're, they're from different tribes and you can tell by their different tattoos. So these tattoos serve to, to increase attractiveness within their group so the the, the better the tattoos they, it shows their beauty and they're seen as very attractive but to outsiders people from other tribes they're seen as less attractive so from an evolutionary perspective this was again seen as something that's adaptive because it prevents um other tribes coming and and kidnapping the women essentially so it beautifies them to the in group and it makes them less attractive to the out group so it protects that in-group versus out-group kind of dynamic. But what does all this have to do with tattooing in the UK? Um, so we can see a lot of similarities. One thing is that a popular area of getting tattooed for women is around their waist, their hips, and under their sternum. And what this is, is it highlights aspects of um, that are important when assessing female attractiveness because it indicates, or, or directly your eye gaze anyway, to indicators of fertility. So waist to hip ratio is something that's really important in assessing attractiveness in women. And we think that that's because it indicates their fertility um, depending on the waist to hip ratio that you have. We can see similarities here in men as well. So for men, because we're not looking at fertility directly in men, we're looking at their muscle mass. So we're looking at their chest to waist ratio. And they've got tattoos typically, you know, the popular place to get tattooed on your biceps, on your chest, 
um, it directs eye gaze up to their chest and their waists. So we can see indicators of their masculinity, which is supported by testosterone, lean muscle mass, how well they've laid down lean muscle mass. So this little picture in the middle here um, comes back to the to the research that I mentioned at the beginning, which was done in 2015. And what this research did, they um, superimposed this tiny little tattoo onto this guy here. And he was seen as being more dominant and healthier um, by other men in particular when he had that tattoo there. So, um, but tattoo research in psychology is typically not being done in the best way, probably because of a lot of these historical underlying assumptions around tattooing as well. Typically what it's done is it's just tried to kind of compare tattooed people and non-tattooed people on maybe aspects of personality or IQ or criminal tendencies or whatever it is. But what they haven't really considered is that you can't just compare tattooed and non-tattooed people because tattooing is so broad in itself. That comparison group means it's so big that you can't you can't find anything meaningful out. It's not taken into consideration why people get tattooed, the extent of their tattooing, the factors that are important in trying to decide where they're getting tattooed or who's going to tattoo them or anything like that. So it's typically not been very nuanced and it's 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 probably overlooked a lot of important research. This is beginning to be rectified. So this is fairly recent research. And what they showed here, they started off wanting to show differences um, in criminal behavior between tattooed and non-tattooed people. But they found that there was no differences. What the, Where the differences were, were was in the content of the tattoos. So there was some content of tattoos which was more indicative of criminal behavior versus more innocuous content in tattoos. So, it's not just about being tattooed, it's about what your tattoos are showing. Another thing that I think is really important to mention, when when there is just this kind of blanket stigma around people who are tattooed and it overlooks a lot of the nuances in tattooing, it, it, it's got the potential to do a real disservice to people who are being trafficked, for example. People who are being trafficked will often be forcibly tattooed as um, you know, to, to show possession of, of them and takes away their ownership. And if if people just view tattooed people as this homogenous kind of blob of um, you know, there oh there's there's clearly something psychologically and mentally wrong with them, it's really overlooking these people as well. So there's lots of different things that we should be thinking about in in when thinking about the psychology of tattooing and the ramifications of that. And that's just one example of that. Um, so what is it that we don't really know? Um, one thing that we don't know is differences in people who undergo tattooing just for the process versus the finished piece. So usually you'll see people, you know, they don't want to put themselves in, in a, the position of being in a lot of pain and things like that. But some people really do. And for some people, it's not about the tattoo as such. It's about the process. And these tattoos, um, you know, it's called the Brutal Black Project. And they will undergo the most painful, purposefully painful tattoo and experience just to see how physically hard they can push themselves. So that's another really interesting aspect to think about in terms of the psychology of tattooing. But what is it that really differentiates between people who do and don't get tattooed for the same reason? So why is it that some people will take the risk of it all going wrong versus some people who just can't entertain those risks? Or what about people who think I'm going to get a tattoo to, comm to commemorate a pet or a, or a loved one and someone else who says absolutely don't want a tattoo for that reason? or why some people want to reclaim ownership of themselves by getting tattooed versus people who don't. So there's still a lot of aspects that we that we don't know about tattooing. And as I say, we haven't really considered the full nuances around tattooing in terms of most of psychology, to be honest. Um, so we kind of still have that to come at the minute. And that is me. Thank you very much.
Hi. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> I forgot to unmute. <laughs> um, what, what I was saying, saying was thank you, Becky. Becky. <laughs> um, if, if anyone, anyone has, has any questions, questions um, please do type them into the chat box. We're going to take a five minute break and then come back for a question and answer session. Um, before we go, in case any of you have to leave, um, I do want to point out that we have next month's Cybar organised. Um, totally different topic. Um, we have a researcher from the Newcastle University and he's um, looking at carbon dioxide in relation to climate change, in particular how to withdraw some of that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere um, to help climate change efforts. So please join us um, next month on the 19th. But for now, I will leave you um, thinking about everything you just heard. Think of some questions to ask our speaker and also see if you can guess some of the celebrities from their tattoos in this little quiz we put together. See Welcome, Welcome back. back. Um, so, so I can see from the questions that everyone really enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Becky. It's really interesting. Um, as I said, I have a lot of questions, but apparently a good host put the audience first. So I will start with some of them. <laughs> um, so we'll just get straight in. Um, so actually, the first question was one that I was going to ask myself. Um, someone asking about the... Um, addictiveness of tattoos is there any research that shows that they're addictive do you tend to find that people that get one tattoo tend to get more so anecdotally I think a lot of people would say that they're addictive I think you'll see a lot of memes and things like that for example especially during lockdown you'll have seen loads on things like Facebook about needing to go out and get more ink and things like that I have a friend at work who's a specialist in addiction and she would say that it, it could be addictive, I think, um, because, you know, the, the kind of the endorphins and the chemicals that it kind of releases when you get in them, um, it, it can be very rewarding. Um, I want to say that I don't think that they are addictive, but then you look at me and maybe, <laughs> maybe there's evidence that, you know, maybe I'm just in denial. <laughs> You're not a great example for that. No, though. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> um, no, I, I find that as well. I have tattoos and I wondered if it's more, I, I'm going to tell you something, you're probably going to be very judgmental on my first tattoo. I'm not very good with pain and I really wanted it and I was terrified to get it. 
and I actually used um, the numbing cream you can buy so you don't yeah. feel it when you got it. Um, the the guy that did it was horrified <laughs> that I had done that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, since then, for some reason, I got the smallest tattoo I had, I had numbed. And then the second one I got, I didn't have numbed, was the biggest one I had. And just went straight in thinking, I can do this. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> and like I wouldn't full sense of security. <laughs> exa- I think that's exactly what it was. Um, but I wonder if it, if it was something to do with that pain, maybe getting the first one thinking, you know what? Actually, it wasn't that bad. I know it, it hurts when you're getting it, but I find as soon as they stop doing it, the pain stops. So it's kind of like you yeah. can manage it. Yeah, exactly. And I think it, there's a lot of factors that go into that. So, you know, thinking, are you sitting there for 10 minutes or are you sitting there for six hours? And how, how you know, accommodating are they in the shop and things like that? But but I think the actual process of, of the tattooing, I think it can, because it can release endorphins and... I think I think it can be very rewarding because like you say you you it's almost like overcoming a hurdle I think so it's like it's like that thing where you're really dreading something and then you do it and you think yes I did it and and so then you go I can do it again and then comes round again and you get into that chair and you're thinking oh god I don't want to do it but then you do it again so I think it probably has something in it yeah I suppose it depends on I don't know the pain level. Um, was there a particular tattoo of yours that was more painful than all the others? Um, my neck was very painful. Yeah. Um, I found it really difficult and and it was really awkward because I went into an open plan shop and he was doing the outline and I was just kind of lying there really still, really, really just wanting to die. And I looked over and there was one of my students um, directly opposite getting tattooed at the same time. And I just thought, I don't like this at all. <laughs> I feel so embarrassed. <laughs> That's a nightmare situation, yeah. <laughs> he was very kind about it, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. Oh, good. <laughs> After, I've got too involved now. I've, I've missed all the questions coming in. Um, hold on, I'm going to have to scroll back up. Sorry. <laughs> talk amongst yourselves that's fine um so the next question um, was asking about cultures through history um do you know of any cultures where tattoos are so taboo that they are in fact sort of illegal or close to the only one i know of off the top of my head would be um in japan where it is really because it's so heavily associated with gang activity that you really can't have a few tattoos on display there um so there is a lot of a lot less um acceptance around tattooing in 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 japan that i know of and so i don't know of any more throughout history off the top of my head but i can imagine based on that that there will be there will be examples of that yeah i i heard about that from um a japanese colleague that i was working with over in america and he mentioned this and i was like Oh, am I like a badass then? Is that what yeah. your first impression was when you saw? I got Did I scare you? Yeah, a tattoo of a bicycle on my ankle. I was like, yeah, are you, are you scared of that? Like, no. Yeah, that's right. You figure that. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, oh, surprisingly, it wasn't the impression he got at all. <laughs> Bless. Um, next, we have someone asking... Um, about memorial tattoos do you know if that is something fairly new or does that have some historical cultural perspective so I think I think kind of commemorating tattoos has always been something that's a thing so always showing you know the, the, maybe it's the stereotypical one like the sailor one of, a, of the man with the heart through and and stuff so commemorating and showing loved ones um or showing your love for loved ones has always been um a thread i think but specifically commemorating com- memorial tattoos i think is something that's quite new either that or the literature around it is very new so looking in at how people work at developing bonds and continuing bonds with someone who's passed um i think is it's only just starting to really be looked at um, and there is still, you know, another relatively new thing is having the the ashes of, of, of a cremated person tattooed into the ink as well. Um, so that's something else that's quite new. Right. I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh, is there extra uh, um, like health and safety associated with that? I would have thought so, and I'd be interested to know that, but I've never looked into it yet. I wonder how willing tattoo artists are to do that. Imagine yeah. if you knocked it over or something that that just terrible outcome oh, God, can you imagine I mean as far as I'm aware there, there is a special company up here that, that specializes in it um so it might be something that you've got to go to, to somewhere specific for that rather than a regular tattoo studio maybe yeah have you noticed um anything to do with one of the tattoo artists I went to, they refused to do any tattooing of names. They just said, we get so many people coming in wanting names changed because people's feelings have changed over time and they're just sick of doing it. I think they wanted the tattoo that they left on someone to be a really celebration. They want people to be happy with it and look at yes. it and be reminded. And I don't think they were happy with the idea of putting a name on there that someone might one day look down and think, oh, God. Yeah, I have heard a lot of examples of that. And, you know, from, from the tattoo's perspective, I think, you know, they're spending so much of their day doing it and, and they've got a right to feel happy at work as well. They And, you know, some tattooists I know who are, we've we've said you know don't necessarily do any tattoo style or anything that you don't particularly enjoy make you know prioritize this the style that you enjoy because you want to be enjoying as you're doing it as well as being able to see the finished piece and if it's something that you're enjoying doing then you're more likely gonna it's gonna look like better because someone's really put their all into it as well so i have seen i have seen um examples of, of people who've refused to do certain work for sure yeah um the next question uh, an interesting one so someone asking uh when you think of body modification in the western world um do you think it's sort of become a step too far so things like tongue splitting implants eye tattoos why do you think people need to go that far i think i think personally that this is all it, it's almost like a natural progression from from tattooing becoming more commonplace so there's there's one aspect that I've noticed in the literature that's really important um in differentiating some tattooed people and it's this need for uniqueness and if all of a sudden everybody's tattooed and everybody has tattoos that are similar to yours there's still this drive to be different and going further so I wonder if if it's kind of a natural progression on from that um, one thing I think is really important, though, is is like the rules and regulations around that in the UK. So I know tongue splitting is illegal now in the UK because of the dangers associated with with the blood loss. I think um, you can still go to other parts of the of the world and get it done, but there's there's also you know there's instances of of practitioners body modification practitioners being put in in prison and things for for doing this work so really rather than trying to lock it all down we need to be able to kind of um sort out appropriate avenues and in support and processes to be able to encourage these more extreme modifications i think allow people to you know express their individuality if they want to yeah i suppose if 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 they want to do it they're willing to go through the pain yeah. um i can't say it's something that appeals to me my pain tolerance is very low strangely <laughs> i've never had my ears pierced because i'm too scared of the pain but i've got multiple tattoos uh, i i understand that yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah i'm a bit more queasy with piercings <laughs> for s some reason it feels more permanent uh. <laughs> I, yeah it does and it goes all the way through so it's yeah. like it's <laughs> Oh, it's madness. Then people yeah. are crazy. <laughs> exactly. Um, so another question we have, um, they'd like to know um, if there is a cultural difference between the scarification and an ink tattoo, did they develop independently or did ink tattoos originate as scarification type thing? As far as I'm aware, tattoos have originated as a kind of scarification, I think. Um, 
and you will see you you still see some in some places in the west as well where they'll they'll do scarification and then rub ink into the scarification so it heals as a as a coloured scar essentially so you still kind of see that practice going on so I think as far as I'm aware the cutting of the skin was a way to get the pigment in there um but I'm not sure it might have it might have developed independently as well yeah I suppose there's a there's a lot of examples of of both of them across the world absolutely and dating back thousands of years so I can I can see it going both ways it's really interesting so the idea that a lot of these sort of tribes getting um, the scarification or tattoos as a way to bring them together to symbolise that it's their tribe to stop others mm-hmm. coming in. Do you think um, there's a difference in the level of tattoos, for example, in big cities, perhaps when you're in an area with lots of people, you don't really have a close community necessarily. You might be more inclined to get a tattoo to bring in um, pe- people like yourselves. Yeah, yeah, that's a really cool good point and I think I think when when you've got such densely populated areas as well being able to sort of identify someone um in that way is even more important to be able to kind of identify someone who you might consider as part of your in-group um you know from across the crowds there 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 she was with the sons of anarchy tattoo and (laughs) and that was it (laughs) um so being able to kind of identify people like that is probably even more important in in densely populated areas i wonder if that's why there's a big surge a lot of people um getting bad tattoos like yeah (laughs) funny tattoos going for funny rather than i really just love this picture of a slightly deformed looking cat <laughs> yeah exactly exactly I mean I, I do enjoy looking at the bad tattoos as well I, I always think it's fun and I, I had to resist putting them in in the slides because I just thought what if I accidentally included somebody's tattoo or something and and it was really offensive but I, I, I love you know what if you've seen where they've got like bad portrait tattoos and they superimpose them onto the original photograph or something we made me friends really enjoy looking at them. <laughs> yeah. we were going to put them um to entertain the audience at the break but then i had the exact same thought what if someone what if that is someone's tattoo that they really yeah. love like what if someone went that's mine <laughs> you know if, if they want it done then yeah great great for them <laughs> yeah if you're happy with it that's the most important thing <laughs> Um, so the next question that we have, um, do you think it's more common for someone to have a tattoo these days than not? Is scarification and and additionally, is scarification legal in the UK? Scarification is legal as far as I'm aware. It was it was legal um, the last time um, I looked into it at all, which was a couple of years ago. Um, I have a friend who's got scarification. I haven't got it done myself. I've got a friend who had it done in the UK. Um I think I, th- I think it probably is harder to find someone who doesn't have tattoos now than somebody who does have tattoos. So, for example, my mum had, um, we got her a tattoo, a, a neck tattoo for her 65th birthday present. Um, and she spent uh, my whole life making fun of us for being tattooed. And then, <laughs> and then she went and got two. And so even you know because attitudes and culture around it changes even someone who you think was so against it at one point you know gets to a certain point and goes now I'm gonna do it (laughs) so yeah I think it's harder to find someone who doesn't have them now I imagine that um anecdote probably totally split the audience I bet a lot of people thought that's a really good idea and then (laughs) others thought of members of the family and thought not a chance in hell (laughs) yeah exactly (laughs) do you think with that um obviously nowadays there's supposed to be sort of um equality not non-bias um in approaches to things like job interviews do you think tattoos still play a role do you think there are people out there that probably still very judgmental negatively so towards tattooed people yeah definitely I think the I think there will be and I think there will be this kind of almost like a hangover of of this bias I think for a long time um I've I've experienced it before um you know my old boss just didn't 
didn't like the fact that I was tattooed. And some people think that it, it lacks professionalism. But I think, so if I was the one doing the interviewing, it might be different. And I wouldn't say that I would necessarily favour somebody who was tattooed, but I might see it slightly differently in terms of, it's a, it's you know an, a, a conversation starter for me because it's something that I'm interested in and someone else might get that same kind of conversation starter with anybody else you know they might see you know oh you've got a pet cat tell me about your cat I love cats and things. so it, it can be different across different people but I think there's there is an, a, there's a certain demographic where I think they have this idea of what professionalism is and what it isn't and this doesn't look professional um no matter how professional you are um unfortunately yeah but I suppose that the more people that have it the more people talk about it and say you know these are people's own choices the way they want to present themselves and particularly in sort of interview settings not try and get rid of that bias it's not going to affect how the person does the job so absolutely and I think I think personally that it's it's an, an important thing to think about in terms of inclusivity um so I, I personally wouldn't function very well in in a suit I don't like you know me me, me thoughts don't flow very well I, f- I need to feel like myself and if I started if I was in a place where they started putting barriers up and I started having to dress more formally and cover me tattoos I wouldn't function as well I wouldn't be able to do my job as well because I don't feel like myself so I know for some people that's probably less of an issue, but in terms of inclusivity, I think I think it's a valid point. Yeah, definitely. And certainly after four months in lockdown, oh, yeah, I had to yeah. had to get dressed to go back to work, and it was it was awful, frankly. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I wouldn't I can, recommend I, it. I can't face my jeans right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fitting into them was a big issue for me, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, so. One of the questions I have saved until last, because I thought it'd be a good one to end on. Um, can There's a, an audience member wanting to know, can you share your personal tattoo journey? I can, um, depending on how long you would like me to go on for. <laughs> um, so I got my first tattoo when I was 16, um, which was very naughty. It was the first time I'd ever skived off school ever in my whole life. I took the afternoon off as my 16th birthday hit and went and got a little tiny little tattoo. Um, and I've made a couple of tattoo mistakes since then. And that was also one of them. I've had them covered a few times and then removed so the little picture of the laser t- um, removal that I showed earlier on that was that was part of mine it was like all on the top of my arm I've had it all removed and then recovered up um I've got the rest of that arm is black um and I've got you know I've got some fan type tattoos as well I've got a Sons of Anarchy tattoo I've got Ragnar off of Vikings I've got Spike off of Buffy with the Vampire Slayer and um, I've also got, you know, a witch and a couple of creepy things on me leg and an Arctic fox randomly on me foot. And then I've got a tattoo across the top of my leg that says science bitch. And that was partly off of being a scientist, but partly because of, um, I can't, Breaking Bad. Um, I've got them on me back. I've had me kids' names tattooed on us and covered over twice, much to their absolute disgust. <laughs> <laughs> They're absolutely disgusted. And I'm like, well, you know, it's always there. You can still see the scars underneath and everything. It's always there. It's just things How did change. you explain that <laughs> one? <laughs> it's like things change. People change. You're always part of me heart and it's always there. But now something else is there as well. <laughs> bold <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I kind of figured you've got to own it don't you <laughs> have you got um any tattoos that you're dying to get or are you are you taking a break have you are you done yeah oh no I'll never be done so I got I got a new one um as soon as the tattoo shops opened again I got me me hand me other hand done. I've got another one booked in for a couple of weeks, which was postponed from lockdown. Um, it'll, it'll never be done, as as my breath my best friend says. You know, 
as soon as you're covered, there's layers that go on top of that. <laughs> so it's it's just never done, I don't think. And this comes back to the whole point about, yeah, I'm not addicted. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so well, hopefully, I suppose if you're if you're really trying to push this forward, um, research wise, which by the sounds of it, there's not that much research out there, yeah. um, then you sound like a, a perfect candidate for it. Certainly, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, yeah. well, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. It was really you're interesting. Well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and thank we'll. Um, certainly keep an eye on your research we might ask you back in future um to see how your your tattoo journey is going <laughs> you can recognize us yeah. <laughs> um thank you and um, thank you to the audience for watching tonight um so there was was one other question actually for me um that i figured i'd leave until now someone asking what i was drinking um which is important beer is important so i am going to answer this one um it's a lovely beer by the first and last brewery in northumberland um it's from their forage collection it is gorse flower um and it's really nice i'd recommend it so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, as I've mentioned, we have another sidebar coming up um, next month, the 19th of August, and it is a researcher from Newcastle University talking about um, CO2 and climate change and his work towards that. Um, if you are interested in learning about any of our other events or the events we have in the past, all of the events we've held in lockdown have been recorded. They're all on the Palace of Science YouTube channel. You can, of course, follow us on our webpage or on all our social media. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. And if you have any feedback, I would love to know. Uh, my name is Nicola. I am the regular events coordinator and I um, put all these events together. So at the moment, um, I'm just picking speakers that I want to hear from, to be honest, and I haven't disappointed myself yet. But if you um, have any speakers or topics you would like to hear about them please do let me know um, you can send us an email or stick it in the chat box now or of course comment on social media um, so thank you for joining us and we will see you next month <laughs>